Modeling real-world processes using stochastic processes necessitates understanding the probabilistic evolution of the model process, both with respect to the state of the process, for example, what is the probability that a particular state is observed under a given model, as well as the time domain, um, i.e. what is the distribution of the time until a particular event is observed. Now indeed, uh, as we will see in the subsequent theory on Poisson processes, uh, we'll begin with some fundamental postulates, rather like axioms, uh, which describe the infinitesimal behavior of such processes, after which the distributional results, both with respect to state and time domain, will fall out from the analysis. Now, as you may have guessed from the title of this video, um, there are two distributions which take a central role in such analysis of Poisson processes, namely the exponential distribution and the Poisson distribution. So for today's video, I'll take you through a quick recap of these distributions. So that is what they look like, uh, relevant properties, and also how to simulate random deviates from such distributions. Now note that this will just be a quick overview. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to be said about these distributions, uh, but what I'll do is just cover everything that's relevant to the present context. So the first distribution, which is of any consequence to the analysis of the Poisson process model class, is that of the exponential distribution. So a continuous random variable, x is distributed exponential lambda, has this density function lambda e to the minus lambda x um, on support the positive reals, uh, where lambda is a so-called rate parameter, which is strictly positive. Now from this, we can easily verify as a simple integration exercise um, that the CDF, or cumulative distribution function, is just given by one minus uh, e to the minus lambda x. And then consequently its survival function, which is just 1 minus the CDF, is just e to the minus lambda x. Okay. Now also, uh, we can easily verify that the mean of this distribution is just 1 divided by lambda, and its variance is 1 divided by lambda squared. So some easy properties to remember. And then finally, we have that the moment generating function of this distribution is given by a very simple expression. Okay, now remember we're talking about the moment generating function here because we're dealing with a continuous random variable. Um, so the moment generating function being defined as the expectation of e to the power tx, where t is some dummy variable. And for this distribution, it happens to be lambda divided by lambda minus t. And this expression holds for t less than lambda. Okay, so again, very simple one to remember. Now, a very interesting property of the exponential distribution is that it is the unique continuous distribution uh, which exhibits the memoryless property, with this property being quantified as follows. So a random variable x is said to be memoryless if and only if the probability that x is greater than, say, t plus s, given that it's known that it's greater than t, is just the same as the probability of x being greater than s, for all s and t greater than or equal to naught. An equivalent statement to this would be that um, this holds if and only if the probability that x is greater than, say, t plus s is just the same as the product of the probabilities of x being greater than t and x being greater than s for all s and t greater than or equal to naught. Now, if we have that, say, x represents the time until some event occurs, then this property translates as follows. If we were to say start a clock at time zero, and then by some time t we observe that the event has not yet occurred, uh, then the distribution of the time until the event occurs does not actually depend on how much time has elapsed up until that point in time, so here being t. So it's sort of very interesting, almost counterintuitive property. Now we'll spare you the proof of this statement. Uh, that the exponential distribution is the unique continuous distribution which exhibits the memoryless property for a separate video. Um, it's obviously very interesting, but not quite crucial to the discussion here, so you can just take it as fact for now. So another useful result to know is the relationship between the exponential distribution and the so-called gamma distribution. So let's have a look at the gamma distribution, and then I'll show you what I'm on about. So, a continuous random variable, y, distributed gamma, alpha, beta, or Erlang, if alpha is discrete, has the following density function. Beta to the power alpha, y to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus beta, y. 
all divided by the gamma function evaluated at alpha minus one. Okay, it has support on the positive reals and it has a shape parameter alpha, which has to be greater than naught um, and a rate parameter beta, which also has to be greater than naught. Now again, it can easily be shown that the mean of this distribution is given by alpha divided by beta and the variance is given by alpha divided by beta squared. So very simple results to remember. And then finally, we have that the moment generating function is given by the expression beta divided by beta minus t, all raised to the pi alpha. Okay. Now, as for the relationship between the exponential and the gamma distribution, you can almost already see it in the moments and the moment generating function there, but consider the following. Let x1, x2, all the way up to xn, be niid exponential lambda random variables. Okay, then we set a new variable, y, to the sum of all of those elements. So the sum of i running from 1 to n over all xi, then that summation must be distributed gamma n lambda, or rather erlang n lambda. Well, the proof is rather simple, and um, it just sub simply follows from the moment generating function of y. Okay, so let's start with that. So from the definition of the moment generating function, we have that the expectation of e to the power ty is the moment generating function of the random variable y, which is just a summation. Okay, now let's plug in the definition of y, which is just the summation. So we'll have that this expression is the expectation of e to the power t multiplied by some summation running from i, i running from 1 to n over all xi. Now that's just a mathematical expression, so we can write that out as a product of exponentials, right? So we end up with the expectation of e to the tx1 times e to the tx2 all the way up to e to the txn. Okay, now, because we set this up so that all the xi's are independent, um, well, we can evaluate those expe expectations individually, and thus we end up with a product of i running from 1 to n of the expectation e to the power txi, which of those xi's are uh, exponential lambda distributed, right? Okay, um, now we should recognize that immediately as the expression for the moment generating function for each xi. Okay, now because they are ID exponential lambda, well, we can just read that off that expression from our theory, and thus we end up with a product of i running from 1 to n um, of lambda divided by lambda minus t. Okay, now because those expressions are the same for all of them, uh, we thus end up with the final expression of lambda divided by lambda minus t, all raised to the power n. And then we say that by the uniqueness of the moment generating function, thus y must be distributed gamma n lambda. Okay, so very neat, simple, useful result um, that we'll be using throughout the theory. So as a final bit of machinery for the exponential distribution, we consider a method for generating random numbers or deviates uh, from such a distribution by way of the so-called probability integral transform. And this follows from a very simple theorem. It goes like this. So let u be a random variable distributed uh, uniform 0, 1, then define a new variable x as being f inverse evaluated at u, where f is some continuous distribution function. Well, then that new variable x will be distributed according to the distribution function f. Unfortunately, the proof is quite simple and straightforward. It goes like this. So the probability that x is less than or equal to x, well, that's just equal to the probability of f inverse at u being less than or equal to x. And that's from the construction we have in the, uh, in the theorem. Um, well, as it happens, because f is monotone increasing since it's a distribution function, well, we can evaluate that probability as the probability that u is less than or equal to f of x. And again, because u is just distributed uniform 0, 1, well, that probability is f of x. Okay, so what this shows is that the distribution of x is f x. Okay, what this also shows is that if we can generate a random uniform deviate and invert a target distribution function, say f, uh, then we can generate deviates from such a distribution using the following simple algorithm. 
Okay, so first let's draw some realizations from a uniform zero one distribution as we denote these realizations as lowercase ui and um, we'll make I don't know, i running one, two, up to however many draws we need and we store those. Then for each of those what we do is we set a new realization of the variable x, so lowercase xi, to f inverse evaluated at the realization ui for all i. Okay, then our new set of xi's, i running from one, two, or way up to however many uh, deviates we want to generate, will be realizations from the distribution function f. Okay, now this procedure basically amounts to generating a random uniform deviate, which will be on zero, one. Okay, so then finding the corresponding coordinate on the probability axis of the CDF, which will also be on 0 and 1, and then reading off the corresponding quantile from that distribution. Okay, and just to be clear, when I say quantile, I mean the output of the quantile function, not an interval. And then that quantile will be the desired random deviate. Okay, now, as you can see, this procedure can be applied to a number of continuous distribution functions, or at least where the CDF is easy to invert. And certainly this is so in the case of the exponential distribution, where we can, for example, generate uh, a realizations ui from a uniform 0, 1 distribution, um, and then set the lowercase xi's to just minus 1 divided by lambda log 1 minus ui. Okay, so that comes from the inverse of the CDF. Or equivalently, we can just set it equal to minus 1 divided by lambda log ui, since ui and 1 minus ui have the same distribution. Okay. Then it will follow that the xi's will be draws from the exponential distribution with rate parameter lambda. Okay. So it's a very simple way of generating random, random deviates from an exponential lambda distribution. Now, we can also use this to generate deviates directly from a gamma distribution, um, but note then that the inverse will need to be calculated numerically, so that's not particularly efficient. So there are other ways of doing uh, the gamma distribution. Alternatively, we can still use this algorithm um, directly to generate deviates for the Erlang distribution, so say Erlang n lambda, um, and that will follow simply by generating n exponential deviates for each target Erlang uh, deviate. Um, so we just incur a bit more uh, numerical overhead, but we can still use the same simple um, algorithm for simulating the deviates from that distribution. So finally, we consider the Poisson distribution. Now, I don't want to underplay the importance of this deceptively simple distribution. As a natural statistical tool where modeling counts are concerned, there are volumes of research dedicated to its applications, and it is a fascinating history. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to state the minimal relevant results, uh, and then we'll see the application of the Poisson distribution as the statistician's primary counting weapon emerge as we cover the theory of Poisson processes. Okay, so a discrete random variable, so note discrete, um, x is distributed Poisson uh, with parameter mu, has mass function mu to the power x divided by x factorial e to the minus mu. It has support on the naturals, including zero, um, with a parameter mu, which has to be greater than naught. Now, as it happens for this distribution, the mean equals the variance equals mu, as you might have guessed from our choice of parameter. And then the probability generating function, now note again, because we're dealing with a discrete random variable, probability generating function um, is given by e to the mu um, s minus one. Okay, so a very simple expression that I'd like you to remember for some of the subsequent theory that we're going to cover. Okay, now just as a passing reference, uh, I'd like to note that there are a number of variants, derivatives, or generalizations of the Poisson distribution, which you will likely find in practical applications. Um, for example, the truncated Poisson, uh, mixtures of Poissons, um, the so-called Conway-Maxwell Poisson distribution, uh, generalization which allows you to account for over and under dispersion. It's a very interesting distribution, um, but we'll probably only run into those when we cover generalizations of linear models. So different subject matter, but probably well worth the read if you're interested. Now, uh, finally, there are a number of ways to simulate deviates from a Poisson distribution. 
which is a fascinating topic in and of itself. Um, indeed, we'll find one way to do this in our excursions on Poisson processes. Um, but I'll include a reference and or link to a paper which covers the algorithm used in the R programming language to generate Poisson random deviates. And then I'll leave it as an exercise um, to cover one algorithm, with, or possibly the simplest algorithm uh, for simulating Poisson random deviates. So I hope you found that interesting. Um, I'll leave some exercises on screen and then I'll see you in the next one.